finally we heard, we heard this in the background, you know, way over, we could hear the sound, the engines, and we knew they were getting closer and closer. They got it, they are our engines. You couldn't miss the sound of our own engines, our C-47s. So as they started coming, gradually, louder, 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 and then right over our head. They're over our head. Of course, we're ready to cheer, but you couldn't cheer. So then we waited for the next uh, wave. Never came. The third wave never came. Bad weather, lack of training, and anti-aircraft gunfire limited the pilot's accuracy that night. Many units failed to land at the designated drop zones. We ended up with only 200 men where 2,000 men were supposed to land. Practically all the regiment landed to the east. They were on the side of the Murderay River, which is facing Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. And they had their maps, and they knew that they had to, to fight their way from the beaches. They had to head west to get to Hill 30, where we were, because Hill 30, that was where the DZ was supposed to take us right up to Hill 30. In hopes of containing German reinforcements, Francis and his fellow soldiers struggled to hold Hill 30. But with only 10% of their expected force, the soldiers were slowly losing ground. And for four days, we were on Hill 30 without any relief, without any supplies. We were running out of ammunition. We, we were down to just a few rounds. And the Germans kept on coming closer and closer and closer. They'd be on patrol, the burp guns. We were ready for hand-to-hand -hand combat. In the five days that passed, the 508 made their way west across the Metairie River. It wasn't until the bloody battle at the Lafayette Causeway that the 508 was in reach of a Hill 30 reunion. Some of the officers were able to have radio communication. They were able to send in the coordinates and tell them where the Germans were to blast the Germans. So I'll never forget being in my foxhole and having, hearing the sound of our own artillery shooting up over my head into the German positions. That was a beautiful sound. It wasn't noise, it was music to my ears to hear that, because I knew they were our own men, our own artillery, and they were really zeroing in on the enemy. And there were a lot of German casualties there. After gaining control of the area between the Metairie and Douve rivers, the 508 enjoyed a brief moment of relief. The fierceness of the battle, the harsh reality of war weighed heavily on Francis. Thoughts of his fiancée were never far from his mind whenever there was a break in the action. I had some very thin, fine writing paper, and I had a pen, and I wrote a letter to Hildegard, to my future wife. And after I wrote that letter, it was my farewell letter, because I, I didn't think I was, I was going to live. We'd already been there about four days. And I knew this is only the beginning. So I took the letter and I put it in my pocket, carried it all the way through Normandy, took it home. I still have the letter. She's never seen it. I showed it to my son. I let him read it. But she's never read that letter. Thank God. She never had to see it. When I wrote it, I started crying. And I, the tears dropped on the paper. And you can still see where the tears stained the paper. And then we started the real battles. And the real battles were one after another. For the first time, Beauceville La Bastille, we had to cross on a pontoon bridge. Engineers had to put up a pontoon bridge. We had to cross the river on a pontoon bridge to get the other side. Then we get into the little towns. We're fighting in these little towns. Before it was everything, we're, we're in the woods. We're in, you know, just dug in the hole. It was unreal, you know. Is this, is this, can this, is this really happening? You know, you mean, is this really happening? And you're out on open ground, you don't see the enemy. Well, all these stuff is coming, you know it's coming from somewhere, and you know it's not friendly. And you have the, so you're running across the field, and you see the dirt flying up in the air, the explosion. And you're far, thank God, I didn't get hit. The, where's the next one? So you keep on running, where's the next one going to land? You know, is it going to land on me? Move forward, move forward. So we kept on moving forward from one little town to another little town. Our whole mission began from that point. But then they said, well, look at you guys are doing such a terrific job, you paratroopers, that uh, it'd be a shame to take you guys out right now. Why don't you just keep on going? So we kept on going. We just kept on cutting across the peninsula and one 
battle after another battle after another battle after another battle. And this, kept, this went on until the 4th of July. We're fighting a war here, and he wants a stick of gum. So I, I finally found some gum, and I start, I threw it, just as I threw it over. Boom! The screaming meat is going to three, one, two, three. I went right down prone, and I went right down on my belly. And then, when it cleared, I turned, all I could see was one, two, three, four, five guys. Every one of them had been hit and I didn't have a scratch on me. And so I started crawling over to them to see if I could help them. And then I'm looking also down and I see Lieutenant Plunkett, he's moaning. And then Lieutenant McDougal, I think, he's moaning. And then there's Ralph Campana, he's moaning. And then I look to my right, these are all over to my left, and then from Ole Major, I look over to the right, and there I see Henning. And Henning is getting up, he's on his haunches. He's, he's like kneeling on his haunches, kneeling back. And he looks over, I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me. His face was half blown off. His eye, eyeball, was hanging by a cord down below his chin. His, his lips, you couldn't see any lips yet. His tongue, and blood coming out of his mouth. His face, half his nose, face, and his hands, he was, he was gurgling, you know. Trying to, he was trying to talk. And finally, he, he got some words out. And he's looking at Lieutenant Plunkett, and he, he sees Lieutenant Plunkett's bad. He sees every, everyone's bad around him. I'm the only one that didn't have a scratch on. And he looks at all these other guys and he realizes what's happened to himself. And he says, shoot me. He says, I don't want to live like this. And our last big battle was on the 4th of July. Some of the guys got mad at some of the things we were asked to do. We were given orders to attack on, the, go, on this hill, on one, Hill 95, Hill 131, and we were, when we were in this t attack, we had the German machine guns lined up. This was a field, we had no cover at all. We had to crawl through the field, and it's cutting right over your head. You didn't dare move an inch, or you know that you're gonna get hit. And we had to, it was kind of murderous, because on that day, it's 4th of July, one of my best buddies, Bill Medford, was killed. He was on the radio, I was on the radio, and I heard his voice. I knew something had happened. And Richardson and a lot of other guys says, we never should have been sent on that mission. Well, of course, we did. And a lot of us survived, a lot of us didn't survive. We had worn the same clothes for 33 days. We'd gone 33 days without any relief, in contact, daily contact with the enemy, day and night, right front line contact with the enemy. And they said, well, look, at, we started off supposedly with 2,000 men on the 6th of June when we jumped in near St. Mary Glees at TZN. And here it is, the 3rd, 4th of July, we had gone from 2,000 to 950. We had better than 50% casualties. Henning survived, Plunkett survived, and McDougal survived. 1982, I go down to Fort Bragg, North Carolina for the first time for the 40th anniversary of the activation of our regiment. And who do I meet there? Hanning is there, Plunkett is there, McDougal is there. And you look at Henning, they had reconstructed his face. You never would believe that he'd have half his face blown off. 60 years has not dimmed the memories of Francis's fellow men of the silk. I never go to bed at night or I never go to church without praying for every damn one of those guys I knew that were killed. And I, I go right through the, the names of every one of them. Someday I'm gonna to have to write this down. The first guy I pray for is Ralph Nicholson. When he jumped out of the plane, as soon as the chute opened, he was hit by Germans, small arms fire. He was dead before he hit the ground. He blew up, he was carrying a landmine. So I pray for Ralph Nicholson, always the first one. 
that I played for our first sergeant, Marshal Wendell, who was killed on the 9th of June. He was the first man in G Company that was killed in Normandy. Then I played for our, our chaplain, Father Ignatius Madonowski. He was a Franciscan. He was killed on the 13th of June. And I pray for Gene Williams. He was the head of our Pathfinder team, and he was killed on, on June 20th in Prato. Then I pray for Chapinski, who was the, at the end of the stick. He was a, they were the two officers. Then I pay for Ole Majors from California, one of my good buddies. Then I pray for Bill Medford, killed on the 4th of July, my good buddy. Then I pay for Art Grashon. Then I pay for Walter Harrelson, he was on the Pathfinder team. Then I pray for Gladwin L. Roberts, he was in G Company. He, he was, had his head blown off on his birthday. Then I play for Charlie Rogers, he was on our Pathfinder team, he was killed in Holland. Then I pay for Ed Trebolowski, he was our first sergeant killed in Holland. Then I pay for Renal Como, he was the communications sergeant killed with Trebolowski in Holland. Then I pay for Wayne Couch, Captain Bill Nation, and then for George Bernard Levin. It may have taken 56 years, but because of a series of events, which began with being interviewed for Patrick O'Donnell's book, Beyond Valor, World War II's Ranger and Airborne Veterans Reveal the Heart of Combat. Francis M. Lamoureux, 508 Parachute Infantry Regiment. Colonel Mendez, if you will please present the award. Francis Lamoureux finally received his belated Bronze Star from none other than his commanding officer from the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment, Colonel Lou Mendez. Francis had always said he wouldn't accept a Bronze Star unless his commanding officer pinned it on him. His wish was finally granted. 